This is Ziki Zabarski. Ziki Zabarski presents The Wisdom of Eve by Mary Orr, as published in Cosmopolitan Magazine, May 1946. Narrated by Samuel Charles Smith, August 2023. The Wisdom of Eve was the basis for the Hollywood movie of 1950, All About Eve, as directed by Joseph L. Mankiewicz. In 1964, Mary Orr and her husband, director-playwright Reginald Denham, adapted The Wisdom of Eve into a successful stage play of the same name. The Wisdom of Eve A young girl is on her way to Hollywood with a contract for $1,000 a week from a major film company in her pocketbook. I shall call her Eve Harrington because that is not her name, though the Eve part of the alias is not inapt considering the original's sneaky activity in a once peaceful garden. In a year or two, I am sure Miss Harrington will be as much of a household word to you as Ingrid Bergman or Joan Fontaine. When she is a star, I am equally positive that the slick publicity agents of Hollywood who surround these celestial beings with glamour will give you their version of her success. But no matter what they concoct, it will not be as interesting or ironic as her real story. It would never occur to them to tell you the truth. Stars must be presented to their public in a warm, sympathetic light, and one could scratch a long time before kindling any such spark from the personality of Eve Harrington. I first saw her on a cold, snowy night in January. I was sitting snugly under a fur rug in the back seat of Margola Cranston's town car. We were parked at the stage entrance of Margola's theatre, waiting for her to come out. By we, I mean Henry, her chauffeur, and I. Henry sat patiently in front of me, displaying the proper fortitude of one whose chief occupation in life was to wit. But marking time was not my long suit, and my gloved fingers played an irritated tattoo on Margola's polychrome upholstery. I am an actress myself, and am able to get in and out of my makeup with the same speed that I duck in and out of a cold shower. Not so Margola. Rarely did she leave the theatre before a quarter to twelve. What went on in her dressing room for three quarters of an hour was a mystery known only to her maid Alice and herself. Consequently, if one wanted to see Margola after the theatre, one waited. However, it was not a lone vigil. There was a crowd at the stage door. They were the usual autograph fans, all with little books open and fountain pens dripping ink. Some appeared to be intelligent theatre-goers. They carried programmes for Margola to sign and had obviously seen the play that evening. I could hear their enthusiastic comments through the tiny opening where I had lowered the car window to let my cigarette smoke escape. A few were boys in uniform with dreams of dating Margola, dreams that would not come true. There was only one person standing there whom I could not catalogue. She stood nearest the car, and I could see her face clearly in the light of the street lamp. It was a young, unusual face, not in the least pretty. Because she was rather plain, the amount of makeup she was wearing seemed to me very odd. What I mean is, false eyelashes can look very much at home on Lana Turner, but the same pair could be incongruous on a schoolteacher. The girl had a serious, prim expression. She was dressed in a warm, practical red coat. On her head, she wore a small dark tam o shanter, which didn't seem to agree with the coat. She also wore high-heeled, open-toed shoes, and standing there in the slush, her feet must have been cold. Her hands were thrust into her coat pockets, and a shabby purse dangled from her left arm. Her manner was shy and reticent. Under their long lashes, her eyes stared at the ground. She stood first on one foot and then on the other to keep warm, but displayed no fatigue at the long wait. I continued to wonder who she was and why she was there until Margola finally appeared at the stage entrance. I had seen her come out many times. It was a superb act. I knew perfectly well she was not in the least surprised to see the crowd gathered there, but her expression was one of delighted amazement. So many people gathered there to see her. It could not be. She smiled and signed the autograph books and spoke first to one and then to another. She radiated graciousness. Everyone would go away exclaiming, what charm, so modest, how kind. Margola would then climb into the car and apologize for keeping me waiting by saying, 
Those tiresome people, such bores, what fools. I was one of Margola's few woman friends. My husband, Lloyd Richards, had written the play in which she was then appearing with great success. Lloyd had written another one of her most popular vehicles. No one knew better than he that a large part of their success was due to Margola's performance. Without her, they might have run five, six or seven weeks. With her, the first play had lasted two years, and the current smash hit showed stubborn signs of outdoing it, for there was no doubt that Margola was a truly great actress. Watching her sign the autographs, I wondered for the thousandth time what made her so great. Nobody would guess it to see her out of the theatre. She was tiny with the childish figure of a Botticelli angel. On stage, her clothes were done by Carnegie, Valentina and Mainbacher. Off stage, they were done by Cranston. They consisted generally of old sweaters and tweed skirts. I had once peeked into her closet and discovered a dozen gowns utterly unworn. I have known her six years and have seen her twice in a decent dress. Once was at the funeral of a big producer for whom she had no respect, and once, when she had to receive a critic's award, she didn't want. Her hair was another cross her friends had to bear. When she was not on stage, it was generally piled on the top of her head, as if she had just fallen out of the bath. Even on stage, it could sometimes be said to resemble a theatre cleaner's mop. That night, it was tucked beneath a hand-painted handkerchief, which she had tied under her chin, peasant fashion. She wore a mink coat, true enough, but on her, it might have been an old muskrat. It was down to her ankles and six years out of style. Nobody but a genius could dress as she did and get away with it. Lloyd has always said that for him she is utterly devoid of sex appeal. To me, she is tremendously attractive. He gives her one asset in the way of beauty, a very obvious one, a pair of enormous eyes which behind the floodlights can betray every thought in a character's mind with crystal clarity. Also, she seems to have the secret of eternal youth. I have seen her in the bright sunshine with no makeup on, and she doesn't look a day over 29 or 30. If Margola ever sees 45 again, I'll have my eyes lifted. We had got along together from the first day we met. I often disagreed with her, argued with her, and wisecracked at her expense. Sometimes Lloyd would look worried and tell me not to go too far, to remember that I owed my penthouse and sables largely to her. However, in spite of my acid tongue, to this day she has preferred my company to most other women's. Being Margola's best friend is in many ways a bit of a bore. I am the type of female who only feels at home dressed in a dashé hat at the Stork Club or El Morocco. As Margola always looks like a Midwest tourist, it is well nigh impossible to persuade her to have supper at any cafe society haunt. She favours a bar behind some delicatessen shop the back booth and Sardis, or her own home. On the night in question, it was home, and home to Margola is a nest of 40 rooms of Great Neck, Long Island, called Capulet's Cottage. That meant I had to stay all night, for first there would be a huge supper, and then conversation until three or four in the morning, as Margola loves to talk by the light of the moon. Consequently, my overnight bag rested uncomfortably on my feet. Lloyd had kissed me goodbye when I had left for the theatre and had gone off with a gleam in his eye to a stag poker session. Have a nice cat party had been his parting words and I knew that he was privately relieved we were not having a foursome with Margola's husband, Clement Howell. Clement is a clever enough director and producer but very English and pompous. Lloyd can only take a certain number of his broad eyes. Margola was close to the car when the shabby little girl with the red coat suddenly stepped into her line of vision. I saw Margola's eyes cloud up and her expression change to one of annoyance. The girl spoke a few words and looked at her in the most supplicating way, her large eyes filled with tears. But she did not succeed in melting the star's icy attitude. I couldn't hear what Margola said to her exactly, but I knew it wasn't nice and I did catch the last phrase which was, I don't want you pestering me here every night. With that, she climbed into the car and slammed the door. Get going, Henry, she commanded the chauffeur, and sank back into the corner of the seat like a sulky child. Well, I said in my most sarcastic tone, I thought you were always so charming to your public. What's the matter with little Miss Redcoat? 
Is she selling something? Margola glared at me. You don't know what I have been through with that girl. You can't imagine what she has said and done to me, how she lied to me and made a fool of me. You can't imagine. Now, Margola, I said, don't act. Don't be so dramatic. What could a poor girl like that do to you? It's too long a story, she said. Besides, I get in a rage every time I think about it. I lighted a cigarette and handed it to her. Come on, I said. You'll have to tell me now. We've got a long drive ahead and nothing to do but talk, and I'm curious. She inhaled deeply. Her name's Eve Harrington, she said. Translated, it spells, Well, she is the most awful girl I have ever met. There are no lengths to which she won't go. Start at the beginning, I urged, not with the third act. How did you ever happen to meet this paragon of all the virtues? It was Clement's fault, Margola sighed after a moment's pause. He first drew my attention to her. He asked me if I had ever noticed the girl who stood at the stage entrance and simply watched me come out. She didn't ask for an autograph or a picture or try to speak to me, just stood there and looked. I said that I hadn't. He said that she always wore a red coat and be sure to give her a look next time. She is wearing a red coat tonight, I interrupted. I know. She flicked my remark aside impatiently. Well, the next time I went into the theater, for a matinee, I think, I saw her. She was there when the afternoon performance was over. I saw her again when I came back after dinner, and when the evening performance was over, she was still there. This time, when I got rid of the crowd, I spoke to her. I asked her if there was anything I could do for her, and she said no. I said I had noticed her at the matinee and that my husband had seen her before. She said she stood there every night. I couldn't believe my ears. I said, well, what do you want? She said, nothing. I said, there must be something. And finally, she said that she knew if she stood there long enough, eventually I would speak to her. I asked if that was all she wanted, and she said, yes that she had first seen me in San Francisco when I toured in Have a Heart. That was my husband's first play in which Margola had appeared, that she had followed me to Los Angeles and had eventually come on to New York. Just to stand at your stage door, I asked, amazed. She went to the play, Margola added, as often as she could afford to. What devotion, I said. That, said Margola sadly, is what I assumed. I was most impressed. I thought, this is my most ardent fan. She follows me clear across the great divide. She sees my plays constantly when she obviously has very little money. She stands night after night at my stage door just to see me come out and finally to have me speak to her. I was moved. I could imagine that Margola was speaking the truth. Her voice sounded husky. So what went on, I urged. Well, Margola answered, I felt that I had to do something to repay this child for her admiration. She was only 22. I thought, I'll give her an evening that she'll always remember, so I invited her to come home with me. She acted as if she were in a seventh heaven. She had a slight accent which she told me was Norwegian. She said that her people had come over here six or seven years before and had finally left her with an aunt and gone back to Norway on a trip. Of course, because of the war, they hadn't been able to return and she hadn't heard from them in months. In the meantime, she had married a young American flyer and had been living in San Francisco because he had gone to the Pacific from there. I asked her how she got along and she said that at first she had had her husband's allotment, but then he had been killed over Bougainville and since then she had lived very meagerly on his insurance. How sad, I exclaimed. Exactly what I thought, Margola said. She told me that seeing me act and watching my plays had been her only happiness since she had had the wire about her husband. It seemed to me that I must do something for her. I found out that she could type and do shorthand. She had worked as a secretary in San Francisco. It suddenly came to me that this girl might make just a secretary for me. You know, I am hard to please, but here was someone who adored me, who would be loyal, who was quiet and at the same time well-bred. She spoke English beautifully and seemed intelligent. So I asked her if she'd like to work for me. You've never seen such a response. She burst into tears and kissed my hand. I generally hate that sort of thing because I know it's insincere. But this time I was sure it was genuine. She was so naive, so unsubtle. The way you read that line suggests she wasn't. Don't jump cues, Margola snapped. 
and for my impatience I had to wait until she had drawn three or four puffs on her cigarette. Well, I gave the wretched girl clothes to wear. I gave her $25 a week. All she had to do was tend to my correspondence, send out pictures and so forth. Some letters she was to answer without bothering me, but anything that she felt needed my particular attention she was to show to me. At first she was ideal, then after a month or so she began to annoy me. How, I couldn't help asking. By staring at me, she stared at me all the time. I would turn around suddenly and catch her eyes on me. It gave me the creeps. Finally, I couldn't stand it any longer. I suddenly realized that she was studying me, imitating my gestures, my ways of speech, almost doing the same things. It was like having a living shadow. At last, I told Clement that he should use the girl at the office, that she could attend to my meal there instead of at home. I wanted to get her out of the house, and at the same time, I didn't want to fire her. I still felt sorry for her. Besides, her work was very satisfactory. Clement was delighted with her. Margola continued a little thin-lipped. His own secretary had just left to be married, and this girl fitted right into her place. She began to read plays for us and made some quite intelligent observations. Then one day we had a rehearsal. It was when we were putting Miss Caswell into the sister part, and I had a toothache and didn't go. My understudy hadn't been called. She was out, and the stage manager wasn't able to get in touch with her. Eve had gone to the rehearsal with Clement to take his notes, and when there wasn't anybody to do my part, she volunteered. Clement told the stage manager to give her the script so that she could read it, and to his amazement she said, Oh, I don't need that. Well, my dear, Margola leaned closer to me as the car spun around a corner. Would you believe it? She knew every line of my part. Not only every line, but every inflection, every gesture. Clement was there to watch Miss Caswell, and he said he forgot all about her. He was so fascinated by Eve's unexpected performance. Was she really good, I asked? Good? Margola raised a painted eyebrow. Good? She was marvellous. Clement even hinted she was slightly better than I am. He didn't dare say so, of course, but he teased me that she was. He said that if he had closed his eyes, he wouldn't have known the difference. What about the Norwegian accent? Apparently, Margola shrugged. That just went. I understand why now. I don't, I said. You will, Margulis stated bluntly. Anyway, Clement was so amazed at the girl's exhibition that he took her out to tea afterwards. She confessed to him that she had always wanted to be an actress and asked him to help her. Asked him, not me. Don't you think that was hatefully deceitful? I admitted that it was, but I thought privately the girl had been rather smart. Great actresses are not noted for encouraging brilliant ingenue. She told him that she had only stood around my stage door because she wanted to meet him, that she considered him the most brilliant director and producer in New York. He didn't tell me that. I found it out later. But Clem was very flattered. After all, he's only a man, and I get more than my share of attention. He's always introduced as Miss Cranston's husband. It probably irritates him more than he admits. But here was someone looking up to him with saucer eyes, telling him he was wonderful, and he fell for it. He told me she was the most talented young girl he had seen in years, that we must help her. I said nothing. I knew I had to handle this very carefully. I asked Eve why she hadn't told me she wanted to be an actress and asked me to help her. She had the nerve, Margola paused for effect, to tell me she knew I wouldn't like the competition. I laughed out loud. It was so ridiculous. Even the best actors in her supporting casts have a tendency to melt into the scenery when Margola gets into her stride. She doesn't like ego, I chuckled. Ego, Margola spat out the word. Wait till I tell you about the letter. It arrived several days after this rehearsal. Eve came to my dressing room before the performance with four or five letters. This particular one was among them. She told me that she thought I ought to give them my personal attention. I put them into my purse, took them home, and forgot about them. Several days later, Eve asked me if I had read them, and I said that I hadn't. She particularly urged me to do so. I promised to, but I still put it off. I hate reading mail. In a few days, she was nagging me again to know if I had read the letters. I still hadn't. That night, Alice told me that Miss Harrington had come to my dressing room while I was on the stage, and had gone all through my pockets and my purse looking for something. I didn't like that, and after the show, I called Eve down for it. 
She said she was looking for those letters, that there was one that was on second thought she felt I ought not to see. I said that as she had given me the letter in the first place, it was a little absurd to decide now that I shouldn't see it. But whether I read the letters or not, she was never again to go through things. She burst into tears and cried that she only wanted to spare me pain. I had been so kind to her, she didn't want my feelings hurt. She had only given me the letter because when she had first read it, she had been so thrilled that she wanted me to see it. Thinking it over, she realized that it might hurt me. I remarked that after the things critics had written about me, nothing in any letter could possibly faze me. I realized now that this entire performance was to get me to read that letter without any more delay, and I am sorry to say it worked. That night, when I got home, it was the first thing I did. It was very easy to pick out the one she was referring to. It went something like this. Dear Miss Cranston, Today I was buying a ticket to see a performance of your play. The door to the theatre was open, and as I could hear voices and no one was watching the door, I wandered inside to see what was going on. It seemed to be a rehearsal. A young girl was playing the part that I recognized when I saw the actual performance as your role. I presume she was your understudy. I know that stars of your caliber are always jealous of the ability of young people, but my dear Miss Cranston, I put you above such petty feelings. I am sure that loving the theatre as you do, you will wish to enrich it. In your company, hidden backstage is the most brilliant young performer I have ever seen. I was spellbound. She brought all your ability plus youth to the part. I waited outside for this young girl and asked her name. It was Harrington. Do help her to get the break she so richly deserves. It was signed, one of your devoted followers. Of course she wrote it herself, I gasped. I think so, Margola said. I was positive, but it was typewritten, so I could not easily prove it. The next day, I merely said to Eve that it was quite a coincidence that the theatre door was ajar when she happened to be rehearsing my part. We never mentioned it again. I resisted comment. I could sense Margola was working up to a big scene. Not long after this, the John Bishop editions came up. I nodded. John Bishop is one of Broadway's better producers. Every season, he holds auditions where talented unknowns can come and do a scene of their own choosing on the stage of his theatre. The judges are other producers, talent scouts from film companies and agents. Mr. Bishop's official reason for this competition is his altruistic desire to give embryonic thespians a chance to be seen. The winner often steps right into a Broadway show. Well, darling, Margola went on. Eve was crazy to participate in Johnny's auditions. She went to Clem and pleaded with him to give her an introduction to Johnny. He said it wasn't necessary, that she merely had to fill in the application blank in Johnny's office, and when her turn came, she would be called. She found that to be true, and from then on, she was no use as a secretary at all. She was in a complete dither about what scene to do, and wanted Clement to advise her and coach her. I told her to do a scene from A Kiss for Cinderella, as I felt she was rather the pathetic, wistful type. But Clem picked out a bit of Ibsen, Hilda in The Master Builder, because it would suit her Scandinavian accent. She naturally took Clement's advice, not mine. She studied the scene, and when she had memorized it, Clement heard her go through it. He came home in thrall. Again, he thought she was marvellous. He insisted that I come down to the theatre and give her some suggestions. By this time, I was so curious to see this future Jean Eagles that I consented. One day before the matinee, I went to the theatre early, and she did the scene for me. Was she really terrific, I asked. I was impressed, Margola admitted reluctantly. She was talented, there was no question about that. She had a marvellous voice, and she read the lines with great sincerity, though this didn't disguise the fact that she was utterly inexperienced and awkward. I suppose that didn't show up when she was copying me in my part, because she had me for a model. I did what I could to help her to hide these defects and showed her a few other little tricks, and she picked them up quickly enough. I wasn't so excited as Clement, but I could see that there was something to his statements. The auditions took place in a few days. She got down to the finals, and then, on the big day, won them. Everybody was terribly excited about her. Movie scouts knocked themselves out to make tests of her. Agents wanted to put her on their files. You'd never seen such excitement. She thought she was made. She was a star overnight, so now the story could come out. What story? Her story. Her true story. 
pathetic, wistful, naive Eve Harrington gave out an interview to the newspapers on how she had fooled the finest actress in the theatre for several months. Fooled you? How? In every way, her entire story was a piece of fiction. She'd never been any closer to San Francisco than Milwaukee where she was born. She was Norwegian by descent, but had picked up her accent from a waitress in her father's restaurant. Her parents were safely in Wisconsin. Why did she want an accent? Glamour, my dear. So many foreign actresses are successful here. She thought an accent would make her. But the parents being trapped by the war in Norway, what was the point of that, I asked? Sympathy. The husband was a plea in the same direction. You mean she wasn't a widow? She had never been married. My God, I said. The entire plot was a masterpiece of detail. Markle went on enjoying my amazement. In Milwaukee, she had been a secretary with stage ambitions. She saved enough money to come to New York and live for six months. Once here, she laid a careful campaign to get ahead in the theater. She made up her mind to become acquainted with Clem and me. I think her ideas went even further. I believe she planned to break up our marriage. Being married to a big producer-director would just suit Eve. She once made a remark to me that every important actress in the theater had a successful man behind her. That part hadn't gelled, but the rest had worked pretty well. As Clem's secretary, she had met most of the big agents, playwrights, and important actors. Now on top of these contacts, she had received a chance to show her ability and come off the winner. It looked very amusing in print that director Clement Howell had had a genius right in his own office and that it had remained for another producer to discover her. Poor Clem took a lot of kidding on that score. That interview was the loudest crowing I ever heard. The funniest part was how I had fallen for that stuff about her being my great fan. It made her out an even greater actress that she had played a role in real life so convincingly that we had both been taken completely for a ride. I could have strangled her. Naturally, she didn't wait to be fired. She resigned as Clem's secretary. She told him she couldn't be tied down to an office any longer. She began to dress in clothes and costumes that would be noticed. She began to wear makeup in quantity because the report on most of her scene tests was no sex appeal. Why is she still standing at your stage door, I asked. I don't understand. That's where we had the last laugh, said Margola brightly. The one thing happened that she hadn't bargained for. You know what Broadway is like. One day you're the toast of the town and the next you're forgotten. She was too inexperienced to have learned that real and lasting success is only built on a long-term foundation. She thought she was all set and it went to her head. She took a few screen tests but didn't photograph well enough to be sensational and Hollywood doesn't bother to experiment with lights and makeup unless you have a real hit behind you. She was an odd type. Certainly not the conventional ingenue, and no part turned up for her. Pretty soon, the agents and producers just forgot all about her. She couldn't even get in to see John Bishop himself, and she was his official protégé. That's when she came crying back to Clem and me. She says that she will stand at my stage door every night until I forgive her. That she was a silly fool when she gave out that interview. That she really did adore me, and at first, her only thoughts had been to get to know me that she will be everlastingly grateful if we will only help her to get a part. But I don't fall into the same trap twice, said Margola determinedly. So far as I am concerned, she can stand at the stage entrance until she turns into a statue. I shan't lift a finger to help her. It's rather a pity, I said, since you say she really is so talented. So what? Margola stubbed out her cigarette in the limousine's ashtray. Lots of girls are talented and never get a chance to show it. She had a chance and she muffed it by her own conceit. She'll never get another opportunity. Probably not. I sighed and stared through the car window at the reflected stars, twinkling like floodlights in Little Neck Bay. No, I thought to myself. The little girl with the red coat will probably spend the rest of her life in obscurity. But I was wrong, so was Margola. Eve Harrington had had that rare second chance. I cursed the day that she got it, for Margola was right. Eve was a bitch, I know, for it was through me that opportunity knocked twice on her door. Several weeks after Margot had told me this story, Lloyd finished his new play, and a prominent manager made immediate plans to produce it. It was a strange play, different from anything Lloyd had written before, and very hard to cast. There was one part which presented insurmountable difficulties. 
It required a young, emotional actress of great strength and power. At the time, it was not large enough for a star, having only three scenes. Lloyd and the manager tried actress after actress, and no one was right. He wanted a certain timid quality that was apparently unobtainable from the synthetic blondes of Broadway. I knew where he could find it. I knew the perfect girl was standing at Margulis' stage door. I had never forgotten the shy expression in Eve Harrington's wide eyes. Finally, when in desperation the manager was about to call the production off, I suggested her to Lloyd. Go around there, I suggested. She always wears a red coat. You can't miss her. If you wash the makeup off her face, you'll have exactly the right type. Furthermore, I hear she can really act. Lloyd thought I was kidding, but finally he did as I told him. She read the part the next day, and they gave it to her. The search was over. All through the rehearsals, Lloyd and the director carefully coached Eve to hide her awkwardness. Lloyd began taking her out to lunch to talk about the part. On the opening night, Eve walked off with the show. It was a hit, and I had to admit it was partly her performance. Her notices were amazing. The movies got excited about her all over again. This time with her success behind her, her tests were a different story. What had once struck Hollywood as no sex appeal, now was called a rare quality. So Eve is on the train with her contract in her pocket. I am going on a trip also. I am heading for Reno to get a divorce. For in spite of her success, Eve had found the time to get engaged to a famous playwright. She is going to marry my husband, Lloyd Richards. 